quick announcement. So all of the panel speakers will be available in the Gather Town meeting system starting at 7.30 uh, Central European time for about half an hour. So if you have any questions that have come up with, within the talk, uh, please uh, come by and join us at the Gather Town. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our speakers for the first uh, panel um, with the title Extending Reality into Our Hearts and Minds to Define the Future of Mixed and Augmented Reality. And I immediately hand over to Christopher Stapleton, who is chairing this panel. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ehrlich. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Stapleton. I'm from Simiosis. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Denise McCall and Mark Billinghurst. All of us are pioneers in our own way. And uh, we're really excited to present this panel because I think that we're looking at really expanding, extending extended reality um, to really kind of look at the virtuality continuum and see that there's things beyond that need to reach to our hearts and minds to define the future of this so-called metaverse that we're, is, is still yet an aspiration. It's not a real thing, but it's what the mixed and augmented reality have been searching for. Um, and so my panelists are Mark Billinghurst, um, em em Empathetic Computing Lab, uh, measuring empathy, um, which is wonderful. He's been a pioneer in augmented reality. We have Denise McCall, who's a founder of SCALE, the Snyder Center for um, Aphasia Life Experience um, Clinic. It's a life participation approach to aphasia group. Um, and she'll explain what aphasia is. She's our subject matter expert, which we always love to tap into because that's the purpose, that's the why in all of what we do. I'm Christopher Stapleton, CEO of Simiosis, who's been doing experience design. And I'm gonna talk about the aspect of um, conversational story creation, which is really looking at fictional simulation in with all of our other continuums. And Valentino Magali, who, who hasn't been able to join us, due to schedule conflict, he's a co-founder and CEO of Soft Care Studio, who's been looking at VR pediatric care. He's been both a practitioner of the technology and within hospitals, working with kids with terminal illness and working with VR. So it's a really exciting area. Um, and so when we look at uh, taking MR and AR innovation from good to gay, what we're talking about is, yeah, it's good to be able to simulate the virtuality um, that's kind of done and good, but to go to gray, you know, really being from the entertainment industry and also the care uh, industry, really our hearts and minds are really so critical in the, the usefulness of the mixed reality continuum. And if we can't connect with others, that human connection, social engagement, um, what's the use of the technology? Um, there is very convenient because of post COVID, but we're really looking at um, the human connection and social engagement with our hearts and minds is one of a basic need, a human need that we really have to connect. But what is that measure? Um, and, and how do we know that we're achieving that? Um, one of the things, areas that we're looking at is all areas of populations that are at risk of isolation, which is an epidemic in the Western world, in the modern world, really. And so, you know, these are invisible populations that are at risk for adverse um, conditions of isolation. And so if we can't fix what we're, we're looking at the hearts and minds, um, you know, we, we, we really haven't solved that remote telepresence aspect with VR or telepresence. So all of our um, panelists are working with this issue. Um, I'm gonna show this video that kind of explains a little bit how I got into it several years ago into aphasia and into telehealth care, working with mixed reality. And in the midst of that, like you said, if the therapist is in there with you, I can be feeding you some language to mm -hmm. augment, to help you. Right. But you're telling the story. It's your story. Right. I don't believe virtual reality can do that because I believe the element of relationship isn't there. And I believe that for the person with aphasia, that interconnection with another human being is extremely important for them. It's really cool. It is cool. It's really cool it? to see because you can see behind you there's there's really cool stuff back there. What is behind there? What are you seeing? 
-hmm. I see you, mm -hmm. and I see where um, a lot of the the trees and mm -hmm. and snap, snap grass okay. right there, mm -hmm. and um, a couple of, here's a big one, mm -hmm. it's a really nice nice big long one. But think how much more enriching it is if it's connected to a story and particularly your story, what you want to be talking about. Then those 20 words are your words and it's telling your story. Let's say you put on that head mounting device and it was as if you were at a construction scene. Right. Oh. And you could tell me what you were doing at that construction scene. Oh yeah, scene. I could say that. I could do it. You can do it. Yeah, I can do it. Yes. You can do it. Yeah, I could. Once one of them put on the head mounted device and saw where he was, all of a sudden his sentence structure became normal, which was very surprising. So this was really important and we'll find out about aphasia, which is a loss of language due to a stroke. Um, and how much it, it brought al them alive. This is before COVID. And since then, we've been working on community centers, really understanding the importance of, of the context of their reality, the connection of other people's realities and, and bringing those together. And we really have looked at, um, looking at XR, extended reality in, in other different continuums. Um, so first of all, we have two, we, we have reality that we all are familiar with. But our reality that we're used to is there is external physical reality with all our senses in the virtuality continuum we talk about. But there's also an internal um, reality, which I call my imaginality, but also you can call it, this is where our emotions, our memories, our visions are. And it's hard to kind of communicate what's inside to people on the outside. Um, and then the third aspect is what we call the sociality. This is what goes between our internal and external realities, which is really helping make connections and overriding the limitations of, of the virtual worlds and the telepresent worlds. And what we're doing is applying this to these populations at risk of isolation, particularly future deep space astronauts, where they're gonna be millions of miles away with only asynchronous communication. And then one of the areas that we've gotten into that we're talking about is this conversational story creation where fictional simulation has been really an important kind of almost telepathic connection between brains. Because when we share stories, we're able to really make a connection that is, that is less tangible, but all the more important. And we've been looking at seeing how that can be measurable and worked into the innovation we're gonna be talking about. So I talked about the panel discussion. We're gonna start with Mark, then go to Denise, and then come to me. And we're just gonna skip over Valentino. And they're gonna talk about their work and all, all these realities coming together to really kind of touch our hearts, to, to reach our minds and interact on a social level. So Mark. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. It's great to be here. So as you said, my name is Mark Billinghurst. I'm the director of the Empathic Computing Lab, which is a research lab across the University of Auckland in New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, and the University of Australia in, in, in Adelaide, Australia. And the focus of our lab, or my lab, is really on uh, can we develop systems that allow us to share what we're hearing, uh, seeing, and feeling with other people, so we look at how we can use a range of different technologies, especially AR and VR technologies, to create connection with people. And we, uh, we augment those technologies with other technologies like physiological sensors that can measure people's uh, brain activity, heart rate, uh, face expression, and other sensors to get an idea of people's emotional uh, state and cognitive level. And so we're going beyond just having uh, video conferencing or shared VR experiences. We're looking at how we can capture people's surroundings and use uh, technology to share those surroundings with others and also be able to help share emotional state between people um, as well. So that's the main focus of my research, as I said before, underlying the, that, uh, or addressing that question about creating um, shared understandings through sharing uh, what we're seeing, hearing and feeling with other people and trying to create a deeper sense, sense of em empathy with other people. Oh, you're on mute, Chris.
so with the biosensors, you were getting a whole nother layer of data um, to really kind of work with to, to communicate with us, whether we're, we're reaching certain areas. It's just a matter of finding a lot of meaning to that data. So this is where we can go to Denise McCall, who is really kind of looking at the meaning behind the data and where are we really reaching others that, that we need to, to get in touch with. Denise? Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist and my area of expertise is aphasia. So Chris already noted that aphasia is a language pr problem generally caused by a stroke or a head injury. And my work has focused on developing treatments that re-engage people with aphasia in community. Um, in 2008, I founded an aphasia center in Baltimore, Maryland called the Scale Center. And our mission is to provide people with a place to connect, to be in community together and engage in communication activities designed to improve their communication competency and ultimately help them re-engage in the wider community. We've served over 250 people with aphasia over the last 13 years. Now, as I mentioned, aphasia is a language problem. It masks a person's inherent competence and dramatically affects conversational interaction as well as the ability to read and write. Um, aphasia leaves the survivor without the ability to participate in conversation. And the consequence of this, of having aphasia, is social isolation. Um, the Scale Aphasia Center provides people with a place to connect. Our treatment approach is designed to improve communication competency and social cohesion. We offer individuals with aphasia the opportunity to participate in small group activities that focus on the use of conversational story creation. Now, this approach involves engaging individuals with aphasia using their imagination and reasoning abilities and they collaborate with their peers to create a story um, from an array of historical and personal artifacts or story troves. And we've been doing this in different platforms, in person, virtually, and using augmentative reality. So for the in-person groups, um, here you can see the members using their heads, heart, and hands to explore the story trove and create their story. They're collaborating, interacting, showing each other artifacts, um, asking questions and commenting. The participation that is briefly captured here was seen across groups with people with varying degrees of aphasia. Their communication was fluid. Um, the participants were engaged completely in the story creation. And we saw increases in social cognitive behaviors, such as their initiation, their commenting, their sharing, their body language, their facial expressions, and their emotional responses. And as patients started gaining confidence in their abilities to express their ideas and opinions, the group cohesion increased and they engaged in communications with one another outside the class. So here we have a system that's doing a really good job in the physical world. But then COVID hit and we had to adjust to providing online care um, using teleconferencing. So this virtual programming has presented new opportunities and challenges. So in addition to language loss, most survivors are paralyzed on one side of their body. This makes it difficult to physically access these in-person centers. It takes so much time and energy to get to a treatment center that they're easily discouraged and they don't come. But virtual programming can occur from home. So some people have been able to master the ability to independently connect remotely. On the other hand, many are too severe. They can't participate because their language deficits make it difficult to navigate connection equipment requirements. Additionally, their verbal production is not really their means of com uh, communication. Instead, they use gestures and pointing and pictures. So current accessibility limitations make it impossible for them to participate. And our whole approach is about people connecting, connecting through their head, heart, and hands. But current virtual platforms don't allow participants to connect with their hands. We see more passive participation because they can't physically explore the objects or show one another items of interest. People with aphasia often communicate without words with their body positioning, 
leading in, using micro expressions um, and um, gestures to help facilitate the communication of their messages. So as you can see um, in this, this group here, you wanna play it for us, Chris, um, in the teleconference condition. Um, the video, that's your next slide is, is with these videos. Yeah, let's, let's go to that. Um, you can see here with the um, teleconference um, videos that we can only see faces. So we lose those other communication modalities that assist in um, people with aphasia in comprehension and expression of their thoughts. So the telepresent video, this is, is that what you want to watch? Yep, just a few seconds of that. So you can kind of see the difference. They're not able to use their hands. They're not able, we're not able to see their micro expressions. Um, we lose the use of gestures. Um, and then lastly, we've been exploring the use of augmentative reality. And augmentative reality allows us uh, to engage other senses, which are important in aphasia because smell and visual images activate the neural pathways in the brain resulting in improved word retrieval. However, HR headsets prohibit the complex group interaction that people rely on, people with aphasia rely on to communicate through eye contact and expressions and gesturing to one another. So while these technologies show promise, they need so much more to be accessible and effective for people who need it most. We need better ways to connect. Current technologies don't allow users to communicate with their head, heart, and hands. And in the wake of 2020's pandemic, therapists are limited in their ability to provide effective treatments. So we're in need of technologies that provide access to the kind of communication that people with aphasia utilize and benefit from in person. So my question is, are we able to design technologies to meet our needs? Right, and so those different areas that, that we need to get into, and it's amazing how much connection we were able to make the physical reality and we're starting to use as the baseline to really kind of see how, where, the, where the virtual and telepresent technology is missing. Um, we're not going to be able to um, hear from um, Valentina, who's working in hospitals with kids um, and helping them communicate with the professional staff and their family. But that is a whole other, other aspect of sociality, which is really critical to really helping their healing. Um, and then for me, um, at Semiosis, we're working on different areas of enterprise and education, as well as therapy. And what we're trying to do is bring some of this technology into every community center in the United States so that it can be accessible by either therapists or teachers or, or, or coaches or whatever kind of subject matter expert needs that remote socialization. Um, and we really realize that sociality is probably the most important and the least effective in the metaverse right now. And so we're working on techniques to measure all of those different realities to really kind of understand, to get some evidence-based data so really we can advance the, the science and application. Um, so right now, um, what I wanna do is ask any of the panelists if they have any questions with each other. Uh, oh, well, yeah, actually, so Mark is gonna go into more depth of um, his lab and how he's been a, a, uh, approaching this challenge um, in our next slide. So I didn't realize that was a video in there, but um, let me get to, there you go, Mark. Uh, sure, so, so on this slide, um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what we are referring to as empathic computing. So empathic computing really sits at the junction of three areas of technology. So one is a trend towards natural collaboration and using high bandwidth video to and high bandwidth connections to support very rich communication cues. A second area is to, towards experience capture. So we've, we've gone from having cameras on our devices looking at our faces to now to capturing and looking at our surroundings and being able to make 3D models of our surroundings and capturing our environments. And then the third area which is really important is implicit understanding. And this is where you have computers that can look at you and listen to you and create models of what you're doing. So that means that 
without you having to explicitly give commands to the system, the system can infer what you're doing implicitly. And the video on the right here is one of the projects we did that kind of encapsulates these three areas. Empathic computing sits at the junction of those three spots. Can you replay the video again, Chris? I think if you just um, oh, sure. re refresh it, let's just start from the beginning. All right. Um, so I think if you just uh, uh, click on some, the video some buttons, again. Some buttons or, work and some buttons don't. Or reload <laughs> so the, um, we, just, re just reload the slide, it's fine. Yeah, that's great. There you go. So in this video, we're seeing what we call empathy glasses. And this is a pair of augmented reality displays that you can wear that um, share video of what you're seeing to a remote person. So that's quite common. But the piece that we've got that's different is that we've added eye tracking and also face expression tracking into the glasses. So the, the green dot there is the, um, the remote person providing pointing information to guide somebody in the real world. But the red dot, which is moving around, is the person's eye gaze. So that means now that the person who is um, providing remote assistance knows where the person who's doing the task in the real world is looking. And that, in, in the studies with the system, we found that it significantly increases the connection between the people. We've also got this technology here using photo sensors to measure face expression. So as the person is performing a task, the system can also recognize face expressions and convey that remotely as well. So this is a, a great example of how you can use technology to share some of the uh, communication cues you have in face-to-face -face communication, some of the implicit cues like gaze and uh, face expression, which until now has been quite difficult to convey remotely in this type of wearable AR situation. So being able to do that, you can create more of an empathic experience and the remote person who's uh, basically looking through your eyes as you do this task now understands more about where you're looking and how you're feeling as you perform the task. So this is a great example of that convergence of natural collaboration, um, experience capture and implicit understanding in this area of empathic computing. What's interesting is even though we're on opposite sides of the world in Denise, these three things are real common in what we're doing also, the natural collaboration with the physical objects, but also being able to take that experience catch, capture and really understand the subtle nuance of the fragility of, of sociality and that implicit understanding. And we may be able, we may be seeing other things in the implicit understanding, but it's really interesting how these all three come together in our work also. Um, so Denise, did you want to follow up on, on, did you have a second part that you wanted to go into more depth as far as um, your work? Yes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our collaboration and that we've been investigating techniques and tools for improving communication competency and so social cohesion in aphasia groups using conversational story creation. And in this um, uh, investigation, we uh, participants work collaboratively to create a story. Each participant takes turns being both the storyteller and the story listener, and the communication, both verbal and nonverbal, from each group member can reveal way new ways that the brain can assist sociality. Sharing stories improves participants' confidence and communication competency. We see subtle changes in social cognitive behaviors such as their body orientation, facial expression, eye contact and gaze, use of gestures, initiation attempts, um, attempts to draw attention to objects or to express ideas. And we see these as the group collaborates on a story creation. And as an experienced clinician, it's clear to me when something has clicked and I can quote, see the light in their eyes, if you will, but the challenge for therapists is how to measure and track the changes in participation when participants have very limited verbal output. We need to be able to ca capture the complexity of group treatment interactions so that we can obtain evidence-based data to quantify what we're observing and measure their conversational competency. And this would allow therapists to annotate the automated capture of targeted behaviors and identify these meaningful patterns in the databases that match what we're seeing and tagging as they relate to these different treatment techniques. And then we can compare um, computer analytics with human reasonings to validate our engagement techniques with evidence-based data. So our recent work has focused on developing a framework um, for measuring social connectedness. Can you show that uh, table? 
um, for me, Chris. We've identified six yeah. states. Yeah, we've identified six stages of sociality that can be tagged by the therapist based on physical, observable patient performances and behaviors. So tagging these behaviors that demonstrate engagement such as leaning in, showing one another objects, prolonged attention to an object, eye contact with their peers, speech initiations, gestures, facial expressions, they all correspond to different stages of social engagement, and these stages can be correlated with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this taper, table illustrates that tags um, are physical observations and measures of sociality. So for example, leaning in to show objects to peers and prolonged attention to objects are signs of being present and curious, even when the individual with aphasia is not producing any language. Identifying and tagging these attempts to engage is relatively easy. However, doing so while managing complex group interactions and providing support is virtually impossible. So therapists need technological support systems that will assist us in assessing behavioral and conversational performance in groups. Um, our participants' emotional responses and verbal and nonverbal communication attempts have to be constantly measured to evaluate the effectiveness of our engagement techniques in these complex group uh, interactions. So the cross-disciplinary collaboration be between semiosis and scale has certainly informed my work and has influenced best practices for aphasia treatment. And I'm excited to learn how social XR innovations can help provide solutions for access and inclusion of people with aphasia through technology. Thank you. Awesome. And, and one of the interesting things here is that what you're looking at as a practitioner is very subjective and very qualitative, but all the computers like biosensors and perceptual computing is very explicit, objective and, and analytical and, and, um, and, and quantitative. And so this is one of the challenges is that we've created a, an activity which is very effective in the physical world but we don't know necessarily why, um, as far as understanding it from a scientific evidence-based data, because we can't transfer it to other clinics without it getting that evidence-based data. And so this is one of the challenges, but how do you aggregate the, the subjective and the, the qualitative with the objective and the quantitative? And this is one of the challenges that we've been getting into um, to finding that. Um, this is one of the areas that, that we've been adding. Um, so what we've been doing is taking the physical session, which you'll see in a, in a, in a faded out video behind there. Um, this is a 360 stereo camera that's capturing everybody's interaction with the central task. Um, on the left, you see a, with a 360 video, we can see it either from a bird's eye view or we can see each face-to-face -face kind of uh, participant. And this is so that we can, in post-analysis and in, in telepresent, we can look in each person's eye. And with the stereo presence, you have a really good combination of being there. And uh, in that observer point is like having your head in the middle of the object. Um, what this does is that in the post-analysis, we can really start to do the transcriptions in aphasia aspects, which means we have to not just transcribe the words, but the utterances, the attempts, the, the gestures. And what we're doing here with this data is trying to bring in perceptual computing to start to measure all these physical nonverbal communication as well as the verbal so that we can start aligning these very subjective tags with the objective data to start to see where there's patterns. And what we're doing this with is not just with therapists and pathologists, but with teachers and librarians and other people to really start to understand, is there a common human thing to kind of understand how to read a human being? Because we as humans have a very acute sense of reading other people. Um, the problem is that our interpretation and assessment is usually poor about reading other people. Um, you can see this in a lot of literature only because every person has only a, you know, a one perspective sample case. What we're trying to do is can we take 
um, subject matter experts from many different sectors and different disciplines to really start to see if they see some common measures in the different stages of sociality that, that Denise has is intentionally very um, subjective and qualitative so that we can start to see whether we can have some of this integrating human reasoning with machine cognition so that we can get something that's more than the sum of those two parts. And this is really what's important about um, augmented intelligence. Um, it's a matter of getting somewhere that's not just replacing human intelligence, but really kind of seeing where this conversation between machine and, and, and human uh, cognition can work together. And this is, we're undergoing this with several different uh, disciplines and different database research areas. And so what this is, is um, this is a diagram of kind of the capture we're doing with this 360 um, area where we have the task of the story trove in the center. We have the participants in different areas in 360 video. We can able to see the overall group interaction, which is very complex and very nuanced. But with some of the data we can collect, it, the machine can take over some of the, the very kind of very laborious work of analyzing video from the therapist. So they can focus on the human to human interaction, spread that over timelines and really kind of look at all the facial recognition, speech expression and, and, and orientation to really start to see the understanding between these. And what we're doing with this data is looking at um, applications for the, actually the space exploration industry because Mars exploration is is gonna be having to face isolation, which is the only psychological obstacle inhabiting Mars. And if we can't solve isolation on earth, how can we solve it in, 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 on Mars? And so we were looking at this deep space sociality that's happening on both the personal and professional level with being deployed for years, million miles away. And it's both the kind of remote interaction, whether on earth or in a habitation on Mars, or remote with either the different of the field area. And we have to also embed this into the, the, the communication technology so we can start to have new models and measures that can start to predict early um, conversational competency to start to see and predict if it can go more wrong as far as the, the, the social cohesion. Because if it doesn't keep on a high level of social cohesion, it will go into social, uh, social isolation. And so this is really difficult because groups can really kind of isolate each other unintentionally in very subtle ways to the point where it doesn't, it can cause harm to the team performance, but also social isolation, as we've seen in all these different populations, whether it's through prejudice or whether it's through disability or deployment or, or whatever, the adverse um, areas of, of isolation, social isolation, is, is depression, poor performance, um, even ill health and suicidality. And this is happening a lot in the, the military world where suicides are up in the rural areas, suicides are up. Um, and the social media isn't really kind of helping this like social cohesion. It's actually causing more social isolation. So the technology itself can not happen. So this is why we're exploring this immersive area and its measures so that we can really start to understand and get data behind that before we send somebody off millions of miles away to Mars um, for years and, and suffer all the adverse conditions of isolation. So this is a kind of a broad perspective in, in all our areas. Um, I'm gonna open up questions first to our panelists and then to others. Um, um, Mark, um, you know, as we're coming together and presenting this stuff we've been doing in our other lives across the world, what are some of your thoughts as far as how this relates to your work? Um, oh, well, I, I really like the taxonomy you've created with the um, imaginality and sociality um, and virtuality continuums and the story underlying that. Um, in, in our work, you know, we're really trying to create um, uh, and recognize um, emotional experiences. And one important part of that is, is the story element. Um, many people have, have been looking at how you can map um, uh, physiological states onto emotion, but it's not really a black box like that. So you can't just say, well, the person's heart rate's gone up and that means they're feeling excited because emotion really revolves around um, context and, and also history as well. So, it's, it's, so when you're in a VR environment, for example, 
um, you have to think about the context of the environment the person's in, and then also their uh, previous contexts and actions and um, back uh, history as well. So the story plays a really important part. So for example, if you're in a VR environment and your heart rate goes up, it may be because you're in a environment that's supposed to be creating a, a, a scary um, experience. And so that means you can correlate that heart rate increase with, with maybe a motion of fear or surprise. Um, but if your heart rate goes up because you're playing a game, it might be because you're moving a lot. So we're doing some work now, um, which taps in a bit more into the story aspects of looking at how people, um, not only can you look at their current context, but you can look at their previous experience as well. So if people, for example, are in an experience where they are in a um, simulated uh, car crash, if the person has been in a real car crash in their life, um, that may, be, that may um, create a lot more traumatic uh, memories and re-experiencing of that um, than somebody who hasn't been in a car crash before. So if we're talking now about storytelling, you can imagine how storytelling creates some of those experiences that people can then draw upon to, to feel emotion. So the uh, taxonomy you presented there really uh, provides a great uh, framework for some of the research that we're doing in the um, um, areas of recognizing people's emotion and using that to create better shared experiences. In uh, military simulation, they have live simulation, virtual simulation, and constructive simulation, which is really the mental model. Um, and they're very similar, different different terminology. Um, and so one of the things that we don't look at, which has been ancient since Aristotle and Plato, is what we call fictional simulation. This is when you read a book and you get transported to another world. Um, Richard Stone, who we collaborate, who wrote the book, Story Intelligence, has this fictional simulation ability that the mind can do. And what it's proven to do is, is bring down walls and barriers um, in between people. So for instance, we're working with restorative justice with this conversational story creation to be able to get people from opposite views and, and to be able to talk to each other. And by not looking at each other and pointing at each other and talking to each other, we take a fictional simulation approach. Where we take another place, another time. And we usually take an ordinary fictional character into extraordinary historical times, like during the, the periods of enslavement and really kind of talk about it separately. And, and, and the fictional simulation allows us to, to bring down some of the former barriers, which is very kind of magical. Um, and then once they start to create a story world together, and the story world is fictional simulation, they have a certain bond that transcends that event. And so that they take it away with them. And so that's, they have that shared story, which is, which is very important and, and almost telepathic, if you will. And so when they get back together, they have an actual relationship that they have to help overcome the obstacles in other communication, be it technical or attitudinal or disability. Um, which is really interesting. So I think story or fictional simulation is going to be a very powerful thing that, that we've had a lot of practice with, but we haven't applied as much to the metaverse. What are your comments, Denise? Well, I was just remembering the, um, that very uh, situation at our center where we had a very diverse group of people of different backgrounds that we did go through a trove that took them back to a fictional character in time through um, who was a, a slave. And um, the conversations that they had about their feelings about um, that character and what they went through um, really stimulated them to be much more interested in the history around that and they ended up traveling together and having lunch together and going to the Harriet Tubman movie together. And um, it formed deep relationship bonds that um, were not there prior to um, being involved in that group together. What's interesting is, is that this one book I looked at, um, read about conversations, is that conversations are world builders. Conversations, I mean, if you take a look at Shakespeare, all his plays are dialogue, but they built all these different worlds. 
And so it's in that conversation and the better we can get to conversational um, connection, um, the better we can do. I mean, a lot of the story, conversational story creation work started when we were working with the Holocaust Museum. And the, the Holocaust Museum said that, you know, we have not just one story, we have millions of stories. And it's not a story that has a tidy ending that, like uh, in Hollywood, it's an open wound. And, and the thing is that when they come here, so many people, when they think of the Holocaust, all they think of the, is the end and the atrocities. But in, in what you need to learn from that uh, Holocaust is not the ending, but the beginning. How did it begin and slowly in, in work there? And so they basically challenged us to say, we don't want, you know, we don't want to come with these hard images to cause trauma in there, and particularly with eighth graders seeing these dead bodies being bulldozered into a mass grave. What we want to do, what's most important, is that we want to have we want to have them start a, a conversation, because it's a conversation that is the only thing they take away from the museum, and it's really powerful. This conversation that that is needs to be really worked into our levels of sociality. I think, um, and that's really what's exciting about getting into some of the actual data that we can pull out. Um, I have a question. If we can. Yeah. I have a question for Mark, if, if I may. Um, I, I was very interested, Mark, in um, the, the short video that you showed where the young man, you were able to look through the communication partner's eyes, that the therapist or whoever was working with this young man was able to see what he saw, and that created um, this connection between them. And um, as you know, with my um, the, the folks that I work with, they're not able to tell us what is drawing their attention or what they want to speak about, but their eye gaze certainly um, indicates that when they look at particular objects. Um, but my challenge would be to be able to do that in real time, that here you're doing it where the therapist is remote, correct? Or the, the, the communication partner is remote and the young man is in person, correct? Um, that's right. So, so we have, um, in this particular example, you've got a person who's trying to do a physical task and in the video, it showed a person who was assembling a, a puzzle out of blocks. And then you've got a room and they're wearing this augmented reality head mount display. And then you've got a remote person who's sitting on the laptop computer, who's seeing what they can see and who can make point, can point at objects in the real world so that they can see them. So it, it could be used in therapy where you've got a therapist who wants to guide somebody through a typical real world activity and um, may, they may have uh, trouble performing the activity because of uh, cognitive disability or, or other disabilities potentially. Right. So yeah, definitely. And the, the key is that because we've got the eye tracking, we know what the person's paying attention to. So you, for example, if you have somebody who's um, has difficulty in ordering from a, 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 at a restaurant, you may, um, because you know where they're looking, you may realize that they're not really looking at the menu. And so you can say, okay, the first thing to do is look at this menu here and you can point at the menu and then make sure they're looking at the menu. And you can also say, well, make eye contact with the, the wait staff when they, when they come and serve you. And you know, so you can guide them through their everyday tasks. Right. What's interesting about our work, Denise, is that we've been working on, even though we work with people with aphasia, one of our biggest challenges is working with people without aphasia to be able to come into that conversation and, and be able to connect. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a hard thing to do, but if you're not used to working with someone with aphasia, it, it becomes very daunting um, for both parties. And so, so being able to train and teach and practice uh, with different types of conversational needs has been very powerful um, in sharing that. What I'd like to do is open up the questions to any of the participants if anyone has any questions. Do we have any um, questions? Um, I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what attendees in the panel, what, what, um, or what um, attendees in the audience would have questions about. So that would be. Do they put those in the chat? Uh, the they can put them in, in the chat. They can do it in the Q and A. Um, they can also post them on Discord, and I'm on Discord right now, so they can post right. this. So there's a few options for people. Um, so 
And um, yeah, but I think chat's probably the easiest. So I'm not sure if anybody has um, any questions on chat they'd like to ask us. Well, let's start with Ehrlich and or Joe. Do you guys have any questions? Sure, Chris, this is Joe. Um, I was actually getting ready to type this question. So, well, first off, let me, let me just say that I really appreciate the work um, that you all are talking about in, in, in the largest sense. Uh, the world certainly needs more empathy and it also needs folks like you all to continue to promote the need for the need for more empathy. So thank so thank you. Um, but I guess so. I guess you know, kind of an obvious question, but one I think that's worth worth um, just touching on is sort of what are the what are the near term barriers, right? If if we can create good enough experience, if we can create quality experiences to truly help people today, and, and I think we can based on what I'm hearing. What are the barriers to kind of getting this out at scale to, to really to really help? And I mean, obviously, there's things like cost of the equipment, but what other types of barriers can you all envision? Well, I, I don't want to step over Denise's uh, comment, but onboarding is the biggest issue because there's a lot of potential in there. But what it takes just to get there is so prohibitive to so many different people with different abilities um, and even with abilities. Um, we've, we make them go through hoops. I just want to put that out there. I know it's not a scientific approach, but boy, if someone could design an app to onboard all of these different other apps so that we can just get over that, we can get more participants. But um, Mark and Denise, you want to answer? Oh, I'll, let, I'll let Denise go first. You want to have some, you want to address what? that, Denise? I'll just follow up with that's that's exactly it. Access and barriers between um, the usability um, of of these tools and and um, onboarding to to do remote and virtual and augmentative are, are really the things we need to overcome. Are there? Yeah, I mean, no. are there? Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Oh no, you go you go ahead, Joe. It's okay. Well, I'm just wondering, are there? Are there models of technology dissemination from the past that we can leverage, right, to help us understand how to get these newer technologies out there? I mean, cer certainly, right, handhelds or tablets had to have had made an attempt to make an impact at some point. Mm -hmm. And it was the same problems. Um, one of the things that I've been working a lot with is what I call a digital interspace. Um, meaning that we worked with from eighth graders to um, uh, people with aphasia is that we learn best socially and the other people are there physically. And so, in, and, and we've, we did these experiences with NASA in educational learning environments where when you push education to be something to be achieved versus consumed like entertainment, it gets frustrating and ambiguous, particularly with creative problem solving. And what, one of the evaluations what we've done is that when we give somebody this frustrating evaluate, a frustrating and, and ambiguous creative problem solving in that museum environment, when it's done alone, it's negative. When we take the frustration and ambiguity out, it's boring. But when you do it together, it's positive. Same activity and that sociality and but when they were in the part it was an, it was it was switching between virtual and physical interactions and stations but when they were involved with the game on the computer they would what they call suck face with monitor with the monitor and in the particularly way games are, are are played and designed it's meant to suck you into that virtual space and take you out of the physical space and to come out of the virtual space to get into the physical space because of the way this the the, the, the game was designed, they would lose points, even though they, they knew they were because they weren't being able to shift that between the real and the virtual, which is happening in the metaverse too. And then what, what that means is that we have to take that virtuality and bring it into their physical space so we can use all heads, hearts, and hands because our, our hands are an extension of our brain and we have to work with them intuitively. I mean, Aristotle talks about this, Plato talks about this. And the issue is that that aspect of understanding that user is not just an eyeball, it's not just a twitching thumb. It is a full body immersed in the context of their environment. And that's in the more that we can do is spatial augmented reality Reality. And then, you know, so we had, I have a video of this somewhere, but what we 
we've done is been able to do that with a physical interspace. The digital means that we bring the virtual and make it physical and virtual that you can fidget with it. So I have a D in that digital spelling. Mm -hmm. And then the interspace is that learning happens between people, not in the virtual world. And when we do, we can push education, therapy, all that stuff much harder. And, and when we do, that's when the synapses go. That's when, you know, all those things go. And, and, and when we do that virtuality, we really have to be capturing the data on that human being and understanding where they're at, because there's so much, the sociality is so important to education, but the sociality is also so fragile between people. A comment, a verb, a, a look can, can shut down. I've been working with teachers in urban schools where it takes a whole lifetime to get them to fall in love with learning and one comment can turn them off. And so that connection that we have, we're already in the mixed reality world, you know, capturing and simulating in all directions, all senses, all dimensions, all realities. We really have to, start to use that data in real time to really kind of understand where is that human and where is that interaction between humans? Um, and what does that mean? And, and, and do we have the evidence-based data? Because I see a lot of data being collected, but it's measure without meaning. And that meaning is, is very subjective, which is good, but it's not, you know, vetted. So we have to combine this, this, machine learning with human learning or the analytical with the analogical uh, to get something that's more than the sum of the two parts. And I think that that is going to be a huge leap for humanity. And I don't think we've ever been there. And I think that it's, it's and, and the other thing is that we really see, need to see innovation as two-legged kind of thing going up a ladder. You have technology we have to advance, but in order, you know, it's, it's advancing humanity that allows us to advance technology. That advanced technology allows us to advance humanity. And the way we go about a lot of these conferences, a lot of these technology is like climbing a ladder with one leg, the technology leg, and not understanding that human leg and really looking at and having that loop between the body, because the body knows when you're trying to climb the ladder with well, <laughs> um, we just have to have that embedded in all of our research, but we've been so siloed in some of the research development and with the data and the data has been driven economically. So we have to really put humanity above the economy. And we've had that problems with humans since the days of slavery. Um, and, and now we're doing it with, you know, I mean, the gig economy is just a, you know, sharecropper 2.0. It really is not necessarily helping. And so that if we can put humanity over the economy, which is over, you know, with in step with the technology, we can align ourselves so that we can literally get to a whole new level of humanity. And it's that connection in between that we naturally do as human beings in our brain. We haven't been pushing our brains and bodies and spirits enough with our technology. So that's a tall order though, <laughs> and a long answer. Well, you know, it's similar in my view that the ecological validity of the kind of work that we do is hard to apply to um, to the real world. Um, we we when you talked about the um, barriers, Joe, there's really this inverse relationship with the severity of aphasia with the ability to use technology and the people that need the technology the most are the people that are most severe. So using these kind of maximal support, multimodality ways to engage people uh, with technology is gonna, uh, is gonna help um, the folks that need it the most, but it's really um, collaborating and finding what, what these various populations need um, by, by meeting in, you know, cross-disciplinary to, determine what 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 would be the ecological validity of the work that we're doing it, it sounds i mean it sounds to me based on what i'm hearing you say denise and also and um, chris i mean the, the, the requirement set here is um is demanding right i mean we're talking about nuanced you know personal to personal communication and treatment so um <laughs> and, groups. and so i mean it's that's that's way different than building um, many of the AR VR environments that we we build today. And Chris, I would love to see funding priorities shifted to to do to do better, you know, to do better for 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 good. 
Um, you know, there's a whole AR and VR for good community. I'm sure you, you're all aware for the aware of that. So um, it's um, a very altruistic um, goal, and uh, yeah, I'm. I'm but it's it's not it. It, it's not unreachable. I, I think it's more reachable than you think because what we do is what we call real world laboratories. If we take our laboratories into the real world. So we're not in our separate laboratory. We're in Denise's space, the problem space. And if we can only bring ourselves into that problem space, we will be more connected. And they're more than needing. But we have to. We can't be intruding to disrupt it. But we we may need some middle spaces to kind of find that transition. But the reality is that investment is not made in the arts, humanities, media, technology because they're also focused on STEM, the invention. The innovation happens in the opposite side of the arts, humanities, technology, and media. That's what causes, and the innovation is about adoption. And so we have to get off of the innovation is disruptive because it's not. True innovation is liberating. An iPhone didn't disrupt anyone except for BlackBerry. And they should have gotten the message a long time ago. But the issue is, the, the thing is that innovation has to be nurturing and liberating. Otherwise, it's not an innovation. It's just your invention that you think everyone should fall in love with. But there's a reason. And if you don't go into the problem space, if you don't cross over disciplines and understand another person's problem, you know, you need other disciplines in your problem space to allow the novice mind to come in to make those creative leaps we need for innovation. It's all doable. And so one of the things that we've been doing is that there's no money in, so, you know, this, this VR for good. I mean, that's all sounds great. There's no money in, in development, the tools we need. So we go to the space industry, we go to the military industry, we go to enterprise to get our money and then what we do is, since knowledge is transferable without being illegal, that's what we use in Denise's lab because no one's going to no one's going to fund Denise's people. I'm sorry, Denise, except you know the families of of their clients. And so this is one of the areas, and this happens in the academic, civic, and and commercial sectors, is that they're so siloed they don't know any the, the broader problem and the broader humanity. And we need to become not just our own separate communities, which is all nice and fun. We need to be a community of communities. And that that's where that sociality comes in. It's not just communication. It's not just speaking. That sociality is something we have to measure in all scales from the individual, from the person to person interaction, from the team or family performance to tribe, to community, to society, and then to that broader humanity. Because now is the first time each individual has more impact on humanity than ever before in the history of man. It can be done now. On that note, I wanna thank you for inviting me to this panel to be an outsider, getting to look in at, at the amazing work that you're doing, Mark, and, um, and, and collaborating with you, Chris. Thank you. Mark, do you have any closing notes? remarks? Oh, I, I just um, want to echo what you said, Chris. I think we've got a great opportunity now. Um, it, um, when, when we've been developing our technology, we came across um, a use case we hadn't thought about before, which is looking at how we could um, how we could help uh, the elderly who are um, increasingly lonely. And this pandemic we've been going through the last two years has really um, taught us the value of, of connection. And, and I, I, it seems like about 60% of those people who are older than 65 report um, loneliness in their lives. And so the technology we've been talking about, you know, that we're doing and the other work that you, you're both doing is really a great tool to be able to help address that. And so I think there's really great opportunities for addressing some of these pervasive problems in society that we haven't had before through using some of the technologies we've been talking about. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah, funding across countries is very difficult. So that's why we're involved with the Florida Israeli um, innovation grants. That's why we're presenting at NATO. Um, you know, we should be able to get over to Australia and New Zealand. So really kind of get this international collaborative kind of support. Um, is really critical because it's not happening in just one country. And VR is the one technology that is advancing in every country all at once. It's never been done before. And this is, this is such a powerful opportunity. So thanks, Joe and Ehrlich. Um, it's one o'clock. 
So hopefully we made our timing correct. Perfect timing. Thanks to all the panel speakers. It was very interesting. And to the audience, um, in half an hour, we uh, opened the Gaza Town meeting room and hopefully our panelists will have some time to answer questions. That'll be great. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe and Antonello for the great organization and see you all over in Gaza Town. Right. Sure, sure. Thanks and and just really Jesus. quick, I just want to say to, to the panelists, I personally pushed for panels this year because I find the panels some of the most compelling content at, at a conference. It's a bias I have. And I use I leave them inspired. And I, I found your words today ins inspiring. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, so much. Thanks a Go lot, panels. <laughs> See you Bye. later. So Bye. Bye. Okay, so I believe we're going Thanks, to promote. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure thing, Mark. Yep. Um,